And it's time for another Nerdline news, which is not as current and up-to-date as normal. I've just moved house, and that's why I haven't really been around much recently. And missed the last Nerdline news. I also haven't set things up properly yet. And for various technical and aesthetic reasons, I will be using an avatar rather than a video recording. Let's take a look at some of the news stories that have come out since, well, the last Nerdline news. We will open with a story I covered a few months ago with regards to the discovery of phosphine gas in the atmosphere and Venus. The paper published in September stoked quite a bit of controversy. There were initial reactions from the International Astronomical Union's Commission on Astrobiology claiming that the authors unnecessarily stoked media hype, a statement which the commission has retracted. A team at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center criticized conclusions claiming that the detection could very well be due to silicon dioxide rather than phosphine. The more aggressive parts of their statement have since been withdrawn. Firstly, the Astronomical Union's statement around media hype is quite unfair. The original paper clearly states that the authors are not confident that the signal indicates life and that it is likely that there is some photochemical process that we are not aware of. This was also very clear in the press release and the interviews. The problem here seems to be a straightforward media tendency to sensationalize and the Astronomical Union has retracted their statement. This channel being what it is and sitting in that particular corner of the internet, this shows that there is significant disagreement within the scientific community and that the media does not play well with scientists, almost like there isn't an overarching conspiracy where these communities are all in cahoots. The argument between Jane Greaves at Cardiff University and Villanueva at NASA have been raging on the archive and spicy discussions have resulted at the American Geophysical Union's full meeting on the 11th of December where a whole morning session was dedicated to the result. Another issue popped up in the data analysis stage when others tried to reproduce the result. Ignaz Snellen from Leiden University highlighted an issue around how the background signal was removed. This process is often as much an art as a science, but one of the methods is to subtract a polynomial equation from the data. As a rule, you want the number of orders in a polynomial as low as possible and really nothing higher than a sixth order polynomial. Jane Greaves' team used a twelfth order polynomial, which should set off some alarm bells. At first, I thought that this was surprising considering some of the authors who were involved in the paper. I would have thought that they would not allow this error to pass. Ignaz Snellen had the same suspicion and highlighted this when attempting to repeat the analysis. The Leiden team argued that the features seen in the process spectrum are likely due to overfitting, which can happen with higher order polynomials. However, in a shock twist, Jane Greaves asked a different independent team to look into these claims, and they conclude that the approach is perfectly valid and produce a similar result using a complementary approach. This paper was uploaded onto the archive on the 10th of December. Now, academia is on a lengthy break over the holidays, which is one of the few perks left in academia. But when everything spins up again in early January, expect this story to develop. Our next story is about quantum electrodynamics. QED is often touted as the best theory ever created. One part backing such a claim is that we can describe the spectrum of hydrogen atoms with an accuracy of up to 12 decimal places. But here comes a problem as well, and this is known as the proton radius problem. When we take normal hydrogen, we can deduce the radius of a proton with reasonable accuracy from the energy levels that the electron can populate. Problems arise when we replace the electron with a muon. A muon is identical to an electron with the exception that it is 200 times more massive. In 2010, measurements using muonic hydrogen revealed a problem. When we have a muon instead of an electron, hydrogen's single proton at the nucleus appears to be 4% smaller. This is a contradiction to the predictions offered by quantum electrodynamics and presented a possible crack in this theory which predicts that there should not be a difference. There is a bit of a sticking point that I have with how the media reports science. Contrary to how it is presented, a successful theory is actually quite bad for scientists. Successful theories are well behaved and offer predictable results. Scientists prefer theories which have gaps and don't behave as well because this is where the work is and this is where things get interesting. So with that in mind, I'll let you decide whether the next bit is good news or bad news. 
Two subsequent measurements performed after the initial 2010 measurements showed different results. The first appeared to confirm the smaller radius, where the second appeared to confirm the larger radius. But now a test has been performed using completely different methods, and the results confirm the smaller radius. And this is important. Everyone recognizes that repeatability is key in science. If you repeat an experiment and get the same results, then you show that the theory holds, but within the confines of the experiment. If you get the same result using a different method, then you show that the theory holds regardless of the experiment. So this complementary measurement shows that it's likely that the measurements are incorrect rather than a theory. In addition, remember that when I said QED has been measured to be accurate to the 12th decimal place, well, this latest measurement actually shows its accuracy to the 13th decimal place, so that is an improvement as well. Next, we go on to a medical physics story, but one that requires a bit of background. When we treat tumors using radiation therapy, the aim is to focus all the radiation on the tumor whilst keeping the dose to normal tissue to a minimum. Currently, this is achieved by rotating the radiation beam around whilst keeping the tumor at the focal points of the radiation. This means that the tumor is always in the path of the radiation beam, while the healthy tissue spends very little time in the path of the beam. We then also take advantage of the fact that healthy tissue is naturally capable of repairing radiation damage and tumors generally aren't as good at this. This is actually intrinsic to one of the key mechanisms that causes cancer in the first place. Tumors tend to come from cells where the repair mechanisms fail and are left to reproduce. The treatment becomes tricky when it comes to brain tumors though. We have several different treatment modalities available, most notably hadron therapy, where it is easy to deliver high doses to the target volume without delivering significant dose to healthy tissue. But this also requires a hospital to have a small synchrotron. A smaller scale solution is something known as gamma knife as developed by Alecta. I'm sure that a competing solution has now been developed by Varian, but I'm a hack and a fraud and I'm going off memory from when I trained in this field about 10 years ago. The idea behind Gamma Knife is basically the same as normal stereotactic radiation therapy where you come in at different angles, but the beams are extremely narrow in this case, and this allows for the fine precision needed when working on the brain without having to install a synchrotron. Hadron and photon therapy both have their advantages and disadvantages, but there is one situation where the game completely changes. This is where the tumor has metastasized. If you have multiple treatment volumes, it becomes very difficult to achieve high dose to tumors without also delivering a high dose to normal tissue, which you don't want. After surgery, radiation therapy is the most effective way at treating cancer. Surgery is the most effective and the most targeted approach. Radiation therapy is slightly less targeted, but also slightly less effective. Chemotherapy is the least effective and the least targeted. But when we combine all three, we end up with a pretty good approach, and a cancer patient's chances of survival are increasing on a daily basis. Okay, I'm going to move ahead because we haven't even started on the story. As you can tell, this is one of my big interests. The researchers who are the subject of this story asked a simple question. Why go through all this effort to rotate the beam such that the dose to the tumor is high and the dose is less to other regions? The point is that planning stereotactic radio surgery is fucking difficult, and this is why physicists will spend years training to do this one job. An alternative would be that you just deliver a low dose of radiation to the entire brain, but use nanotechnology to ensure that the tumors are extremely susceptible to radiation. A few groups have shown results of a phase 1 trial where participants were injected with different nanoparticles which cluster at the tumor site. When irradiated, electrons in the nanoparticles are bumped out of their orbits such that more ionizations can take place to cause damage to the tumor cells. Phase 1 trials test the dose that should be given to patients. Increasing doses are given to different participants until the desired effect is achieved or adverse reactions happen. Once you have reached a dose that achieves the desired effects without adverse events, you can use that to inform phase 2 trials where you give that dose to a larger number of participants as the initial safety test. In this case, promising results were achieved in patients with cancers that had metastasized to the brain. Conventional radiotherapy was not considered a suitable treatment for these patients. I won't go into the technical reasons as I can drone on about this subject for hours. In one trial, 12 out of 14 patients experienced clinical benefits from the treatments with an average survival of 5.5 months. 
Four patients were still alive after 12 months. Considering that we are talking about metastases in the brain, this is pretty good. But another trial focused on primary tumors in patients who had advanced stage head and neck squamous cell carcinomas, which couldn't be removed using surgery. The participants were over 65, which means that their response to chemotherapy is likely to be limited. The median survival of these cases is around a year. In 9 out of 13 patients in this trial, the treatment resulted in complete tumor response, which means that after treatment, no tumors were detected. It is still early days for this kind of treatment, and a lot more work is to be done before reasonable results will be established, but this is a very promising start. Every year, the Institute of Physics lists the top 10 breakthroughs, and this year the top spot went to Alain Fidali, Alain Dijkstra, and Erik Bakkers at the University of Eindhoven for their development of a silicon-based material with a direct band gap. I suppose that this is enough said for anyone who has taken an introductory class in condensed matter physics, but I'll go through this for most people who are not in a know. Semiconductors are interesting materials. When we think about a material's ability to conduct electricity, we have two bands in which the material's electrons can sit. First, we have the valence band, which represents the energy levels in which an outer shell electron can sit. Then we have the conduction band, which represents the energy levels at which an electron is free to flow around a material. We need electrons in a conduction band for the material to be conductive. In good conductors, these two bands overlap. In insulators, there is a huge separation between the bands, and we cannot reasonably expect the valence electrons to jump this gap. In semiconductors, there exists a band gap, but this one is relatively small, and it doesn't require too much energy to get the electrons to jump from the valence band to the conduction band. I know that there are some pedants out there, don't worry, I know that this is a horrible oversimplification. Our purpose here is to translate a news story, not to train scientists. Silicon is one of these materials which has this property, but it also has another property which is rather useful. It is dirt cheap and easy to get hold of. After oxygen, it is the most abundant element on the planet. So surely silicon is a great material for semiconductors, right? Well, on its own, it isn't. We normally integrate other materials to make useful devices. This is due to the nature of that band gap. What needs to happen is for an electron to jump from the highest energy state in the valence band to the lowest available energy state in the conduction band. We can have something called a direct band gap where all that needs to happen is that the electron gains sufficient energy to make this jump. But in the case of standard crystalline silicon, there is an indirect band gap where a change in energy is not enough. There needs to be a simultaneous change in the crystal momentum as well. And this is a cool application of the uncertainty principle. The electron can actually jump to an unavailable energy state and stay there for a very short period of time. The length of this period is determined by the uncertainty principle. And this is called a virtual state. Unless its momentum changes in this short period of time, it will just go back down to the initial state as if nothing ever happened. There are many materials which have a direct band gap, but the problem here is that these materials are expensive and their extraction is insanely damaging to the environment. So naturally, a material which is ubiquitous and easy to extract is desired. Now, a silicon solution does exist in the form of amorphous silicon, which is the material of choice for solar cells, but it isn't very efficient and has a very limited lifespan. Crystalline silicon usually sits in a diamond lattice, and it is this that results in this indirect band gap. What Erik Bakkers and his team achieved is growing a silicon and germanium-based material such that it forms a hexagonal lattice where this is no longer an issue. But the next challenge is to find a way to grow these materials in a hexagonal lattice on a simple flat substrate rather than the nanowires that they used before. And this would change this rather cool result into something that could change the world. Direct band gap materials are hugely important in optoelectronics, which are electronics where light plays a role. Being able to cheaply produce more efficient solar cells, LEDs and semiconductor lasers using more sustainable materials will deliver many advantages in future technologies. Finally, I will close off on a couple of short stories. 
The iconic Arecibo Observatory has been rapidly closed after some faults, namely a cable snapping in early August. After an engineering checkup, it was determined that it wouldn't be a big issue. However, a second cable snapped shortly after and the resultant damage is irreparable. Arecibo is an iconic instrument to the community, but it has been dethroned as the largest radio telescope by the 500-meter aperture spherical radio telescope, or FAST, also known as Chanyan. Despite no longer being the big shot, Arecibo is still a hugely successful machine and sufficient for a lot of work to be done in astronomy. One important part of Arecibo is the impact it had on the local community as it had a major role in science outreach in Puerto Rico. Arecibo went beyond just providing awe-inspiring venues for school trips. It actually welcomed students at all levels to actually use the equipment and carry out observations and perform real science. And not only was Arecibo exceptional as outreach, for many communities it was the only avenue for outreach, and this will now be lost. A team at the Kassler Brassel Laboratory in Paris have shown results measuring the fine structure constant with an accuracy of 81 parts per trillion, which is two and a half times more precise than the previous measurements. The fine structure constant is a fundamental constant which quantifies the strength between elementary charged particles and indicates that with a value of 1 over 137, the electromagnetic force is weak. The main consequence is that electrons orbit some distance from the nucleus and therefore it is possible for chemical bonds to form. This new measurement also puts further constraints on the properties of dark matter which may help with the detection of the stuff. High-energy proton collisions at CERN have given a glimpse into interactions between hyperons. The team working on the ALICE experiment at the LHC investigated how hyperons interact with protons. Protons and neutrons are baryons containing up and down quarks, two up and one down for protons and one up and two down for neutrons. Hyperons also contain three quarks, but one of them is a strange quark. The standard model makes a series of predictions about how protons and hyperons should interact and the results appear to confirm these predictions. These results provide a direction to focus future research as these interactions may be able to shed more light on how this strong force works. Now I don't like to give the Dark Lord airtime but I figured that I should mention that SpaceX's Starship crashed at the end of a test flight. The idea was to launch Starship to suborbital flight and make it re-enter the atmosphere with its long axis parallel to the Earth's surface. The idea was to make it perform a flip so it could land with the right side facing up. It did everything right apart from slowing down sufficiently and things went completely when it hit the deck. It is important to remember that this is still important progress as it gives more knowledge about how not to do things, which represents actually more than 99% of the work in science and technology. But anyway, that's it for this edition. Uh, Again, apologies for things being a bit different. I will hopefully have things back to normal soon. I would like to thank my patrons for their support. It has been a huge help and I'm nearly at a point now where I can make some serious upgrades to my equipment. A huge thanks to my newest patrons who are John Heron, Steve, Alexander and Samuel Robotham. You guys are awesome. I would also like to thank YouTube for a 640 one-off donation via Kofi. Thank you very much. So with that, thank you all for watching and until next time.